it gives me much pleasure to um, acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. That's particularly relevant for the talk tonight. So before we actually start our talk, I'm going to introduce um, Peter Gibson from the Canberra uh, Medical Society, who's going to just briefly tell us a little bit about a fundraiser we held here recently about this particular program that Simon Steele is going to tell us about. How many people were at Sunday Dreamy at Government House uh, recently? Well, oh, that's good to see. I mean, it was such a glorious day. And uh, we had lots of lovely artworks and, and things from Better World Arts and Alperstein and Tiwi and so on. And it was very successful. And so I'm here tonight to just report back that we look like raising 30,000, 40,000, which uh, Canberra Medical Society will be donating to this wonderful project that we're going to hear about tonight. But uh, uh, these are some of the artworks that are still for sale. And to my way of thinking, the Shorty Robertson, uh, the blue one in the middle there, is uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, Shorty was uh, one of the artists from UNMU who we brought to Canberra to have their eyes fixed. Uh, most of them had cataracts and were thinking of giving up uh, painting. So he's, he's one of the beneficiaries of our um, eye project about 10 years ago. Um, Anyway, uh, feel free to come and inspect these where you can see them from there. But if there's any interest, uh, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, we may actually have to freight them back. So I'd thank you all for coming to Sunday Dreaming. And uh, we hope to be holding future events in support uh, of uh, Simon's project. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. And and could you convey our thanks to the society as well? Um, they did a fantastic job um, raising money, uh, both for this, but they've also given funds um, previously to support uh, this project. So now it gives me a great pleasure to um, invite Simon Steele to, to give tonight's uh, director's talk. Simon has been at the John Curtin School for a, uh, a long time. He was um, direct, director of the Genetic Epide Epidemiology Group in 1994. That's probably before we knew absolutely anything at all about genetics. Um, he's um, put a foot in the water in um, commercialization. And my first interaction with Simon was when he was representing a government commercialization company trying to commercialize research around Australia. And I ran into him after that as when he was doing a couple of years worth of consulting to the Menzies Research Institute in, in Tasmania. Simon's interests in genetics are to try and understand how evolution has shaped our genomes and how it has shaped our response to the world around us. And in this field, he is extremely well known and, in fact, one could almost say famous. But what we're going to hear about tonight is um, a project that he started a couple of years ago. And I think it's probably one of the most important projects, if I could say, Simon, that he's actually uh, begun yet. And that is to ca capitalise on a resource that has been built up at the ANU probably over the last 50 or 60 years where um, researchers have actually collected samples and stories of history from people from around our region and have actually stored them at the ANU. And had it not been for Simon, these um, resources would have essentially lain dormant for God knows how many years. But he's come along and he's actually um, started up a program for us to actually use those resources and to actually generate um, what is an incredibly valuable um, outcome uh, using these incredibly valuable resources. So Simon is going to tell us about it, so thanks very much. So uh, thank you very much, Simon, and I hope that I can, the talk will live up to the expectation that you've just, you've just um, created. Um, the, uh, I'm the Simon with at the beard, by the way. We both have the same tie because these ties were on sale at the auction. Um, at the weekend, and uh, we have similar tastes, obviously. Uh, I, on this public occasion, I also uh, acknowledge the indigenous people of the country that we, where we meet, 
And I would also like to welcome to this talk Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from other parts of Australia. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you this evening about the National Centre of Indigenous Genomics, and in that context, I also want to pay my respects to those Indigenous Australians who have donated blood samples uh, that are at the foundation of the ANSIG collection and are stored in freezers here at the John Curtin School, and to their descendants, both present and future. Biological samples are collected from about in excess of 6,000 people, as Simon said, starting about 50 years ago. Um, they are part of a broader connection, as I'll, I'll describe it in a minute. They also, in addition to that, there are field notes, correspondence, and information about people, their families and communities, which are extremely rich and were very well uh, made. Uh, uh, and um, so there's a, there's a really valuable, two very valuable parts of this uh, collection. It's sometimes easy um, in working in a uh, laboratory environment such as the one here to forget that in the DNA present in each of these samples um, contains stories about the history and health of the person who donated it. Um, it's a very personal thing. Um, we see them just as uh, in a rack in the freezer, but the, each one of these is a very personal thing in relation to a, a particular person. Um, so this evening I'm going to tell you uh, about how this collection came to be made, um, its significance and importance, its potential uses, and benefits and how we're working uh, now with, uh, with Aboriginal communities to enable the, poten the potential of this collection to be realised. The centre was born out of a need to manage um, these collections of samples and records. Um, and it, but it also now, I think, and I hope you'll see this in the course of this uh, uh, presentation, it, it, pr it, do it's, it's now do it does more than that. It, it now provides a more general framework under Indigenous governance that will enable Indigenous Australians to benefit from the advances in genome science. So um, while it was uh, set up and still the primary purpose is to uh, deal uh, in a sense with the management problem associated with this collection, uh, we hope that it uh, can do a great deal more than that. Um, so just very quickly to start, the, the, the National Centre for Indigenous Genomics, is, um, its mission is to establish a managed collection of indigenous biospecimens and associated data that can be used by researchers under indigenous governance for projects that aim to provide broad benefit to the people and communities providing the biospecimens, their descendants, the broader indigenous community and the, the general Australian community. So why were these samples collected? For a variety of purposes and the, and the story of that is quite complex, um, but uh, the a large proportion of them were collected as part of, uh, particularly in the Northern Territory, as part of the human adaptability section of the International Biological Program, an international effort that, that, uh, that was aimed to take stock of the biosphere. And this was a, um, a, a very optimistic, uh, big international program that developed after the war that some of you, like me, might be old enough to remember something about. But it had many arms. It was all over the world. Um, it, it, uh, most of it dealt not with humans, but uh, there was a lot of work in Australia in, in, um, in what we now refer to as environmental research and agriculture as well. Um, and, and importantly, population genetics, as distinct from clinical genetics, was intended to form a significant part of the work of this section of the larger program. The samples themselves uh, came from locations, as I said, throughout much of Australia. The colour coding here is, does not mean anything. It was my colourblind efforts at, at doing some sort of categorization. But uh, in three states, uh, three, uh, two states and territories, uh, Queensland, uh, the Northern Territory and Western Australia. The uh, collections were made um, by, by a long time ago. The person primarily uh, responsible for that, for that was uh, Dr. Bob Kirk, who was head of the Human Genetics Department here at, uh, at, at the John Curtin School. And here he is, and there are two important things about this photograph. The first is that the um, other man there is an eminent immunologist from Oxford. The other point is uh, the very substantial infrastructure that you can see uh, on, the, on the bench there. Um, this was state-of-the-art infrastructure, and it, was, um, uh, uh, it looks like um, something rather um, primitive now, but it, it was certainly something that didn't exist in many places at that time. And it was largely because of Bob's ability, to, through the block grant funding at the ANU, through the John Curtin School, to, pr pr to build that, um, uh, that then attracted um, the work from various people to, to, to here, uh, just to, to plug the importance of infrastructure. Um, and of course, as I said, the, the, the people came, important people came from far and wide to, to marvel um, at this. And uh, here is uh, Bob, again, looking at results, and this is to make the point that 
the, uh, the, the material was used for research quite extensively. Uh, and here he is with uh, Marge Coggan, who has uh, been very grateful to, to have her assistance in, in more recent times to help us to go through and find some of the material and, and sort it out. Because she had, was really the person who kept uh, uh, the, the, the whole collection together over the years. Um, the, uh, uh, we have a, a photographic record um, of uh, many of the field trips involved that was uh, kindly donated by Pip Deverson, Bob Kirk's daughter. And there were just some of the scenes that are uh, captured there from, this is from uh, Leonora in the Western Desert and uh, here at, at near Halls Creek in, in the Kimberley. This is Bob with uh, somebody that we, we're very hopeful we'll be able to identify uh, soon. I should say we've already identified uh, at least two people in the previous photograph. Here again is a group uh, going out in the field waiting for the barge on the Forest River at the, at the foreshore at Wyndham. And back to the Western Desert, the uh, Warburton Rangers a Hospital here, we can see in the, in the centre of this photograph, you can see Bob and the collection gear here that was used to bring samples back. And in Queensland, there's a family from the Monument Mission about the same time. So as I said, this collection is part of a much larger collection of material from different parts of the world. Some of the locations of those are shown here. The map is sort of washed out a bit, I'm afraid, but the, uh, you can get the general picture. Um, about 70,000 samples in all. And, um, uh, I'll come back to that, the, the significance of that later. Um, now, as I said, quite a bit of work was done uh, at the time on these samples, and um, we've now identified, in fact, well over 100 articles published on the basis of them, and here's just a sample of those. This uh, first uh, paper in The Lancet was a very interesting study, and, and we're reconnecting with the people that were involved in that, um, in that study now. I won't go through this in detail. Um, some of you will be familiar with the uh, the paper that came out in Nature, um, it, uh, the, the one Cannon, and Stone King and Wilson there, um, doesn't involve uh, uh, Bob from here, but included a substantial number of samples that were collected here. This was a, a paper that uh, really um, uh, 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 substantially revised our understanding of modern human origins. Um, and uh, the, the samples from here we used in, in, that, in that study, as I say. Um, the uh, the, um, it, during the 1990s, there was in particular one program, the uh, Human Genome Diversity Project, which uh, was carried out uh, and planned and organized by anthropologists and human geneticists um, without bothering to consult indigenous people about what they thought about it. This was to basically to catalog uh, uh, genetic variation throughout the world. There was a huge backlash to this, and particularly that was the case in this country. A, a, a entirely justifiable backlash in my view and we decided at that time to close down this collection and to do no further work on it until uh, we were able to establish uh, an appropriate dialogue with indigenous communities about how it should be used. In doing that we recognised that genetic research in indigenous populations requires a specific, specific set of ethical approaches that are due to the historical and ongoing oppression of, of indigenous people and to their distinctive cultural beliefs and practices. So we essentially closed the, 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 uh, the collection down and then um, uh, tried to find a way forward, which was very difficult, but we didn't really know where to turn. And then about four years ago or so, uh, out of the blue, uh, Emma Koval, who I'm pleased is uh, here tonight, contacted me at, uh, on the phone. And Emma, uh, who at the time was at the University of Melbourne, is now at Deakin University, is now, and the, the director, uh, deputy director of the centre, had been running workshops through the Loetcher Institute um, with Professor Ian Anderson uh, on bringing together indigenous people and geneticists to work out um, how genetic research might be appropriately uh, carried out to, in a sense, overcome um, the barrier that had been created. Um, and so Emma had heard about this collection and called me up and I was delighted uh, and uh, met with her and um, uh, there were a, a, a couple cut a, a long story short, but we um, uh, met with uh, Professor Anderson, uh, Ian Anderson, and we went through a, a series of processes internally at the ANU to, to get things going. And we, were, we really wanted to um, uh, find a way, in a sense, in, in, in an appropriate way, to uh, bring together the world's oldest living cultures with, with its new science and to do this properly um, so that everyone could benefit um, from that. That's, that's our manager, Michael. And, on the Derby foreshore, uh, Derby Wharf, by the way. Um, we just come back from the Kimberley last week. One of the things that we did 
the university did, was to set up a, a committee of an eminent indigenous people entirely external to the university. And that committee, uh, the Indigenous Consultative Committee, the membership um, is shown there. Ian Anderson chaired this committee. Uh, Kerry Arabina, who some of you will know as a graduate from this university. Uh, Mick Gooder, uh, Misty Jenkins, who I'm very happy is here um, this evening as well. Um, Marcia Langton, Glenn Pearson, and Mark Wenatong. And in addition, we had uh, consultative, uh, consultative uh, input from a number of people, and they're shown in this picture. I won't go through everybody in the picture. And um, a senior administrative people in, in, in the university. The, the, I would just mention uh, Mandy Thomas, who was the pro-vice-chancellor of research at the time and was extremely helpful in getting this whole process started. She's not shown there. Um, now, Emma, in a, then, uh, in, in addition to setting up the committee, Emma gave them some material to, to work with. So um, we went through this material and, and provided uh, in a, a very substantial document, which I meant to bring down with me, but it's a very substantial document, went through and um, really documented what was in this collection, how it had been collected, um, what it might be used for, and so on. So they had something substantial to base their uh, thinking on. And also a, a set of options with, uh, we went into this entirely in their hands. We had no preconception of what might come out. And so the, um, uh, the options included destroying the collection. And we, we, we went in um, with, you know, with no um, preconceived idea of what, what the outcome might be. Um, the committee uh, then made a series of nine recommendations to the university, which were accepted in full. Um, in early 2013, and um, uh, I just I won't go through them all, um, but I just want to put up the pre some of the preamble comments that they made in their recommendations. Um, uh, the committee was overwhelmingly um, enthusiastic about the potential value of this collection, and they uh, uh, put in their report that the collection has immense cultural, historical, and scientific importance. So. Um, not just the scientific importance here, but also, uh, please note, the, the cultural and historical importance of the collection. Uh, they uh, thought it should be preserved and developed for appropriate research purposes. Um, that's now in our mission. And that the doing so would mark a watershed moment in the history of Indigenous research and bioethics in, in, in Australia. So they, they really saw this as an important development. The outcome of the process would be good research and would also provide a model for the conduct of genetic research with indigenous populations both in Australia and elsewhere in the world. So they gave us the charge of leading, uh, leading the world by example. Finally, the, the, the we, the, they recommended that the uh, university set up a governance board to oversee uh, this process. So, um, and we, uh, we did that and I'll come back to that in a minute. But at the same time, um, this collection had gone into uh, decline. It had been neglected and we had to spend some time, um, and Jackie Stenhouse who's here was uh, um, uh, involved from the start and a postdoc Zoe Pritchard and then followed by Karina uh, a bit later on, uh, literally going around finding boxes in freezers and um, filing cabinets in uh, locked rooms and things and putting all of this together because it had, you have to understand we have moved from an old building into a new building and, and in that transitional period there was no interest in where there was a, an interest, I, I tried to make sure that things didn't get thrown out but, and, and was successful, but there was, there was a lot of um, confusion about things were and so on. So we, we literally had to go around and find the material um, and the, both the, the documents and the, and, the, and the boxes of samples that were in freezers. Um, and it was a very substantial undertaking. It was an archaeological expedition in a sense. We had to go digging. The ENSIG launched in February 2014. Mick Gooder uh, launched uh, there and we were very fortunate. Um, also in the picture at the bottom there, there's uh, uh, Misty, Misty Jenkins again and uh, Mick, Do uh, Mick Dodson who's on our board. And we're very fortunate that Bob's two daughters um, were able to attend the launch as well. The board was set up and um, the board members, uh, the board is shown here. So we've now uh, got a governance and management arrangement which, in which ENSIG is uh, established as a university centre as a, and as a department in the John Curtin School of Medical Research. Uh, we have the Indigenous-led governance board, Mick Gooder is the chair of that board, and a research advisory committee with a number of Indigenous members on, on the advisory committee. We've also developed a comprehensive ethics and governance framework covering all aspects of our activities, and that's available on our website. Um, and uh, that is a, a, an evolving document. We've already had a discussion, extensive discussion uh, today about the ongoing process of revising that. We are now engaging with communities and we are revising 
uh, things as we go along. But it serves as a, an initial framework and guides what we do. So it's essentially a policy that the board has set, out, set down to, to govern everything we do. So why is this important? It's important for a couple of reasons. Now, genome science um, is important in health and medicine. It's also important in uh, historical research. And it really is starting now, um, uh, despite uh, reservations people might have and the amount of hyperbole that, that has been associated with this, it really is having a transformative effect, particularly in the area of, of cancer diagnosis and treatment, but also increasingly in the identification of rare disorders and uh, the development of treatment for those, and, and more generally than that. So we're sitting, starting to see a real uh, transformation of the health system as a consequence of this uh, new data set. And I'll, there's some very large international projects that I'll just touch on uh, elsewhere in the world that have uh, taken that forward. Some of you may have attended Stephen Leslie's uh, uh, talk uh, recently about the People in the British Isles project. Stephen is on our research advisory board and I'm working with him uh, to develop new methodologies that may would be appropriate for, uh, for the work in the centre. There's also a, a huge interest increasingly in, in genetic genealogy. There's a lot of interest in using uh, genetic information to um, understand one's, um, uh, genet the, at least the genetic component of one's um, uh, ancestry. Um, now, all of this requires very large genome data sets, and I just th the, the statement at the bottom, to understand one genome sequence, you need to sequence a million genomes. Now, a million just means a large number here. This is important to provide context for interpretation, and it's at all levels. So, you know, even in the laboratory level, in terms of quality control, you do better quality control if you have large numbers to, um, of samples to compare your sample with. Uh, in just in terms of discovery and scientific inference, um, in a whole range of different ways, it's very important to have large data sets. And in terms of clinical interpretation, um, it's important. So these uh, data sets have been created globally but through disease-specific and large national product, uh, projects. And I'll just mention a couple of these. Um, in Genomics in England, uh, it, it, with the National Health Services, are creating a lasting legacy in the form of uh, sequenced data for 100,000 people in the United Kingdom. And the National Institutes of Health recently announced the, um, uh, the Personalised Medicine Initiative, uh, which involves setting up a cohort of a million people. And as I said, there's a lot of very large studies associated with specific diseases as well. So there's this huge volume of data being produced around the world. Um, uh, that, and there are then efforts to assist in the responsible and appropriate sharing of that data um, so that people can take full advantage of it uh, and, and that it can be used to maximum uh, benefit. It's important to note that these projects do more than just combine research development and, and service provision. They aim to build data and knowledge infrastructure. In fact, in the, in the uh, American one there, I think it is that, um, new ways of doing research. So it's fundamentally transforming the way that research is done and the way in which that then tra gets translated into clinical practice. The question is, um, who benefits? The primary beneficiaries are the people providing the data and the people and the countries creating knowledge and infrastructure. And who loses out are the countries not creating knowledge and infrastructure and the people with uh, different genetic and environmental health determinants than the people involved in these studies. So people are very different from the people who are being studied here. Um, may not benefit, may lose out on many of the benefits. Um, so the statement at the bottom there is, is, the, is the important one. Without knowledge about the genomes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people, they will, they will be excluded from many of the benefits that flow uh, from this important area of medical research. And rather than helping to close the health gap, human genome research may actually cause health disparities to increase, simply by providing benefits to some people but not to others. Um, so that, that, that's a very important inclusive argument. Um, so, um, I'll just quote a couple of quote, one quote and then another one a little bit later on to emphasise that point. Now, this was a, this quote from uh, Robert Green at Harvard Medical School, who's the leader in this field, and um, he points out that our ancestries are actually quite different than the, uh, sorry, other ancestries that are different from the ancestry of European Americans, this is an American context, so that some sort of variant categorisation does not always apply. And so we're actually facing this very peculiar situation where there is a potential health disparity arising out of the very databases we use to apply genomic medicine and that it, uh, this is an intolerable situation has to be addressed. It, it simply is something we cannot tolerate, we cannot promote further by having discriminatory practice in how we build our databases. So that's a recognition that, 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 that there's a problem here 
Um, and I'll just give you an example here of um, a remarkable study of Inuit people in Greenland, where it was found that there's a, an unusual variant of this gene here, and 23% of Inuit people have this unusual variant. And those that do are 10 times more likely to get diabetes than other people. And they also have higher levels of insulin resistance and, and plasma glucose levels, and that's shown in the graph down here. This is a remarkable finding by any standards, the, the strength of that association. But the most amazing thing is that this variant is not found anywhere else in the world except among these people. And so the implication is that the um, uh, diabetics, diabetic Inu Inu Inuits with diabetes are, um, perhaps have some, a, a, degree, a disease which is uh, slightly different than the diabetes of other people. And um, uh, they may, for example, be uh, taking their medication faithfully and doing all the things that doctor tells them to do and getting no benefit from that because and then being accused of not uh, following, uh, not doing the, the, you know, what the doctor's telling them to do and so on. Um, uh, and uh, we don't know whether that's the case here as well, but there's no reason to think that similar kinds of things will, uh, will not, be the, not be found here. This disparity is being addressed around the world um, through regional genome projects. And there's two, two of them in particular, uh, Carlos Slim, who uh, many of you will know uh, competes with Bill Gates as, to be the richest man in the world. He's a, a Mexican a man, and he um, has initiated the Slim Initiative for Genome Medicine in the Americas and in collaboration with the Broad Institute, a $139 million project. The Wellcome Trust and the NIH Human Heredity and Health in Africa project uh, is another project that they put uh, $50 million in to start that project, and there's other funding coming in subsequent to that. Um, the Simons Foundation Genome Diversity Project is also uh, fun, uh, funded uh, uh, a project to look at genome diversity around the world. And a quote from the African project, if the dearth of genomic research involving Africans persists, the potential health and economic benefits emanating from genome science may elude an entire continent. Similar investment to this is needed to extend the health and other benefits of genome science to indigenous Australians. Um, and from, as this map, uh, which is just taken as an example of studies of genome variation around the world, shows that um, usually Australia is completely off the map. Uh, indigenous Australians are virtually absent from current studies of human genome variation. But it's important, um, and we, Michael and I were in the Kimberley last week, and I think I heard um, uh, uh, the, 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 the refrain, um, we're the most researched people in the world, I think three or four times. So indigenous people sometimes say, not just in this country, but elsewhere, that we are the most researched people in the world. And in genomics, this is clearly a false statement. The opposite is true. But the point here is not whether this is a true statement or not. It's a political statement. And um, Linda Smith, um, the Maori scholar, has uh, put it very succinctly, I think, in, in the quote here. The truth of the, such a comment is unimportant. What does need to be taken seriously is the sense of weight and unspoken cynicism about research and the message that the message conveys. Research told us things we already knew, suggested things that would not work, and made careers for people who already had jobs. Now, we've encountered that kind of cynicism in communities we've visited to some extent. I think we've overcome them uh, to some extent, um, but certainly the, there's a, a, a reason, I think, uh, for, for people to see, see things this way. Um, there are some additional considerations in genomics and medical research. Um, it is important, to, I think, to understand the past. I've mentioned the Human Genome Diversity Project, but going further back in time, there is a, a genetic-based theories of evolution have been historically um, used to justify oppression and support, uh, a bit they've been supported, the oppression has been supported by scientific theories of racial inferiority. Um, so we're doing genetics, genomics, we're doing something here which obviously um, uh, is quite sensitive. Uh, and um, the other point to make is that health and medical research, indigenous people have long argued that, uh, that is not conducted in line with indigenous cultural values and in partnership with indigenous people is unlikely to lead to health benefits and may even cause harm. So we would contend uh, that indigenous people will only receive the benefits of genome science if research is carried out through effective engagement with indigenous communities. And much of our current efforts are involved in uh, the, 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 the process of community engagement. We started this in July last year in the Kimberley, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to meet uh, Mick Gooder and Tim Wilson, the Human Rights Commissioner, who were doing a tour of the Kimberley at the time um, in, Fitzroy, in the town of Fitzroy Crossing. And uh, we met at the offices of the Kimberley 
Aboriginal Law and Cultural Centre in Fitzroy Crossing. The Kimberley's a hard place to get to, Fitzroy Crossing's a hard place to get to. It's quicker to fly to Los Angeles than it is to get to Fitzroy Crossing, as we found out last week again. Um, the, uh, the, the meeting went extremely well, and we had a number of other meetings in, in, in the Kimberley. Um, Tim and Mick uh, uh, became interested in the idea on this trip of um, uh, developing a framework for uh, uh, um, uh, including um, proper discussion about property rights in terms of land, uh, land rights discussion. And last weekend, they held a meeting in Broome, uh, which was very well attended and went very well, I understand. And uh, it also gave uh, Mick another reason to go to the Kimberley. So we, um, oh, I should just say that uh, the, the first round of meetings went so well that we were invited to attend the Calic Festival um, uh, later in the year, and uh, Misty and Mick represented the centre at that festival to talk um, Mick to men and Misty to women um, about the work at the centre and to try to start explaining it to people. Um, uh, as I said, Mick, Mick had a reason to be back in the Kimberley, so uh, Michael and I got on a plane and went out there, and, and we had a follow-up meeting with Calac, uh, which was extremely good. And we had a number of people uh, present there from different parts of the Kimberley, and it went very well. Um, and uh, the uh, Fitzroy Crossing is a very interesting place, and it, 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 it's, it uh, brought home a couple of things to me. Um, the first is that uh, Brookings Station, the uh, Brookings Spring Station, which is where the uh, current um, Fitzroy, uh, the, the crossing in is, and we stayed, um, it was uh, essentially closed the circle of um, European settlement in this country. Um, it was, it, it, the spread north from Sydney and the spread south from Sydney met up with the building of the homestead on that site in Fitzroy Crossing in a hundred years after um, the first arrival of Europeans. And this is documented in this excellent account of the history of Fitzroy Crossing. More recent history is important in emphasising what I was saying about genetically based racial inferiority in the background here. That that needs to be taken into account when engaging with indigenous people. And this is a comment from 1949. I don't know that I want, want to read through it, but you can look at, look at what's being said there, and the message is very clear. This is an official government document. It's re reproduced in full in this book. There is a um, justifiable reason for people to be somewhat uh, cautious in, in embarking on the kind of project that we're, we're suggesting. Um, the other thing that it brought home to me was the impact of diversity on the process of engagement. Now, I'm not a linguist and I'm aware of the uncertainties around some of these, uh, um, these issues, but there, the, 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 there are a lot of language, languages before contact in Australia. Most of those belong to a single language family. And then there are a number of other language families in um, the Gulf Country, the Top End and, and the Kimberley. Just to put that in perspective, in the continent of Africa, there are vastly many more languages in Africa but there are essentially, if you disregard the Austronesian speaking people on the island of Madagascar, mainland Africa, if you like, um, there are essentially four language families. Frances Morphy and her study of the, uh, from Kaifa here at the ANU, and her study of the uh, Fitzroy Valley uh, population, uh, developed this uh, cultural map for the, just for the town of Fitzroy Crossing. And you can see, and I won't go through it in detail, but you can see from the shading codes that the, essentially Fitzroy Crossing is made up of a series of suburbs um, loosely connected, and, but they, they have different cultural identities. And so you have within this town a number of pockets of people with uh, very different cultural backgrounds. Now that's a consequence of recent history, which I won't go into, but the people were brought here from different places. Um, and so you actually have, um, all, uh, at the language family level at least, as much, much linguistic diversity among local people, not blow-ins like me, in Fitzroy Crossing as there is in the whole of continental Africa. Um, and this has very interesting and important scientific implications, but it, it also means that in terms of engaging with the local community, um, we're working through CALAC, but we can't um, have a single point of contact, if you like. There are multiple communities here, even within a single town. And this is a microcosm, obviously, for the whole country. But um, even within the single town, it's necessary to have a number of people engaged to talk to local people. Another uh, aspect of our community engagement, with another branch of it, was in, in Queensland, where we've been working with a, a, a woman, Leslie Williams, from Cherbourg. And here we all are visiting the, the Ration Shed Museum at uh, Cherbourg. 
And this was interesting because I'm, when I was at Broome this most recent time, I, I met Val Coombs, who some of you will know was a, a graduate from this university and is visiting us on Friday. And Val's PhD uh, documents the um, policy, uh, uh, policy changes within Queensland, uh, both sides of the referendum. And um, when we were there in, in the um, dining room of the motel, um, uh, Mick called Val and, uh, to discuss because the samples that we, had, uh, we have here from Sherberg were collected as part of a study of uh, childhood health in communities, in Aboriginal communities in Queensland. And it's historically very important because that study which was conducted in uh, 1967, at, uh, the date of the referendum, and published a couple of years later, uh, was instrumental in showing that the childhood mortality rates, for example, they showed a whole number of things, but were six times higher in these communities than they were in the general uh, population in Queensland, which gave a lie to the Queensland government's um, assertions that it was doing a fine job looking after people and stimulated the Commonwealth government, which now was empowered to, to act, uh, to provide funding for Aboriginal health um, in Queensland. So, uh, and the samples here are collected as part of that and, and so the, 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 there's a lot of interest um, from that, that historical point of view. The other component is we're working through the Machado Joseph Disease Foundation based in Groot Island. Um, MJD, if you want to give money to someone other than us, um, I would seriously uh, like to suggest that you might think give them. Uh, MJD is a, is a, a, a terrible affliction. It's a, it's a neurodegenerative disease, uh, very much like uh, Huntington's disease. And the, the prevalence of this disease is in, in um, Eastern Arnhem Land is higher than anywhere else in the world. And uh, there's a map there that shows, shows this. Um, all of that is ongoing. Um, the, uh, we are uh, in the process of hiring, and if uh, you know anyone who might be interested, we have an advertisement out currently for Indigenous Community Engagement Coordinator. We are doing genome sequencing funded by um, Bioplatforms Australia and uh, we're starting to develop an educational program. We are also dealing with a number of issues. There are other communities who have approached us and asked whether they could be involved in this project. Um, and uh, there are data sets uh, out there in, as part of other projects that we uh, can see value in um, bringing in and managing as a, as a co cohesive resource. Um, and uh, there are samples at other institutions that people have asked us to, whether we could be, become the custodians of. So we're dealing with all of those issues. Um, we're not at any, uh, in any sense uh, in a position to deal with them effectively. We're developing policies in, in, in order to do that. Uh, we're also discussing the other applications of this, the data here, potentially in terms of developing protocols to help with the provenance of uh, repatriated human remains where that provenance is not being documented. And we also, to go back to the larger collection I mentioned, um, interested in uh, eventually extending uh, this work to include indigenous populations outside Australia to, so that they can be, all be incorporated into a national resource um, that provides the framework, if you like, the, the, um, the, 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 the essential underpinnings to the uh, application of genome science to, to people of Australia. We will get data from Irish people and British people and other people which we can borrow, but no one else will do uh, the sequencing of the indigenous people of this region and no one else will do it in a way uh, that's appropriate. So we can add that contribution to the national effort if you like. We're breaking new ground. We find that every turn we make we come up against something that is uh, extremely challenging. Um, I've discussed very briefly the community engagement, the model we've developed for that, and the, the aspects of that are, that are quite novel and I don't have time now to go into that in detail. Um, we're developing um, models for consent uh, that are challenging because in addition to the usual um, concerns about consent, we have uh, um, a number of issues that particularly relate to the fact that many of the people who provided these samples are no longer living. Um, and again, that, that, that's a, um, uh, an area where we're uh, doing a lot of uh, quite innovative work, I think. Um, we have a new uh, research governance model, um, and which is very unusual, it's unique in this university, um, uh, and we're developing new approaches to data management and information architecture 
and um, I'm not going to have time to show you, but we have been funded by the Australian National Data Service to produce a resource which um, uh, presents this, and I'll briefly uh, show it as a slide later on, but um, uh, the way in which we're doing that. And um, as I said, we're uh, developing new methods of data analysis that may be particularly important in, in the context of this work. And uh, uh, the ANU has undertaken to employ world's best practice in all aspects of this work, and we're, um, uh, we, we're, we're endeavouring to do that as, as, as much as we possibly can. Um, and I want to uh, just make one point um, before I move on to uh, show you uh, one of the other things that we're doing, um, which is the, 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 this idea of reciprocal transformation. I think that we are embedded in the fabric of the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure through our engagement with the ANS, the Australian National Data Service, and also by Platforms Australia, and certainly within ANU's research educational translation activities and infrastructure. This arrangement obviously has enormous benefits for our, in terms of our activities and our ability to uh, provide benefit to, um, uh, to Indigenous people. But there is a reciprocal, um, there is a reciprocal transformation, and, and that is that because of the way that we're doing things, we are, um, in a sense, driving improvement and innovation in the infrastructure training, teaching, and, and research processes. And the example of that goes back to those major uh, international projects that I meant at the beginning. At the heart of those, in all of the documentation you'll see about them, is the importance of community engagement. Um, it becoming increasingly necessary to develop long-term uh, relationships of trust with people in, who uh, previously would be regarded as research subjects that were from which something was obtained on a one-off basis. And um, the point here is that we have to do this, and we're do putting a huge amount of effort into it, and I think we're doing it um, effectively. Uh, it's very easy for this to be overlooked in a broader context because it's terribly difficult, and it is much easier to just keep doing things the way that they've been doing. So in a sense, the the, um, the requirement that we have in this area and in others to do things rather differently uh, is driving a process of innovation that I think has broader implications. Um, the, one of those examples um, I mentioned briefly, and I'm afraid I won't have time to show you, is the uh, development of the, um, the website. Uh, and um, it will be going live at the end of the month, so um, it'll be linked into our main website. And I encourage you to look at that. I think it's a, um, it's a very interesting way of uh, making um, uh, documents, data available in a way that provides context. So it, pro it gives you a much better way of understanding um, the importance, significance, meaning of the things that you're looking at. And Karina and Kathy Brown in particular have been working extremely hard over the last few months to get that going. Um, we're also developing a genome, uh, the genome database, our genome database and browser. That's not quite ready. Uh, to, for public viewing at the stage two, and Ben Kaler has been very uh, importantly involved in that. Finally, with the initial money that we received from the Canberra Medical Society, uh, we were able to develop, um, we we're in the process of developing a series of video animations which will assist with the community engagement process and um, will provide a different way of uh, giving uh, the, the information part of informed consent to people. Um, and so um, the first of these uh, is now, you can now view it from our website, and we have taken out this and road tested it. The people that we met with in Fitzroy Crossing couldn't get enough of it. We had, they wanted to take it out to communities and show it to people, and here it is. Imagine your veins are like rivers and your blood is like their waters, with lots of stories to tell. They actually let us know where we come from and explain to us why we get sick. These stories are already in the blood in our bodies and are written in language that doctors and scientists can understand. These stories are called DNA, and the stories come from both our mothers and fathers. They got the DNA stories from their mothers and fathers who got it from their mothers and fathers. Because this has been going on for thousands of years, DNA stories can tell the story of a very, very big family. People share some of their stories with other people from the same area, even if they are not from the same family or clan. 
So when we look into the story of the DNA for a person, we also see a little part of the DNA story of their ancestors from thousands of years ago. Understanding the DNA stories can help scientists to understand more about why some families and communities have lots of people with diseases like diabetes and kidney problems, and other families have only a few. It can also help us understand why medicines work well for some people, but for other people they don't work or can even make them sick. Long time ago, small bits of blood called samples were taken from Aboriginal people in communities all over Australia. Right now, the samples are being kept at the Australian National University in Canberra. A mob called the National Centre for Indigenous Genomics, NCIG, are looking after them. This mob have a board with mostly Aboriginal people. They know it's important for us to know about our blood and our stories. They are not really sure how much those old people knew about giving their blood samples. So they think that their families should be able to decide now what to do with them. If you and your family decide that the sample should stay in the collection, the NCIG mob would get the DNA story out of the sample and read the story of the blood onto computers. The DNA stories from each sample will be put together with the stories from all around Australia to make a library. The stories in this library computer will have no names, only the DNA story and the community where the sample came from. Sometimes researchers, like doctors, who are looking to find out more about diseases might ask to look at some of the DNA stories. They will have to ask the NCIG mob first. If the NCIG mob think that their project could help Aboriginal people, they will let them read the story, only for that project. The NCIG mob are being very careful to make sure that Aboriginal people are in charge of decisions about who can read the stories and what they can read them for. You'll be able to see what the sample is being used for on an app on your mobile phone or computer. So you can say no anytime you want to using that app. This is a very new thing for everyone, but the NCIG mob want to make sure that the DNA stories can be used to help Aboriginal families and all Aboriginal people. Keeping these stories might be very important for all Aboriginal people. What do you mob think about that? So we're very pleased with how that's worked. That's, uh, so with that I'm going to finish and ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name's Dave Johnson. I'm the Chair of the Australian Indigenous Archaeologists Association um, and Director of, of um, Aboriginal Archaeologists Australia. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for the presentation tonight. It's the first time I was aware of this centre and the research that is you and your staff and colleagues are doing. <laughs> The, there is a reason this research has not occurred in this country before. Aboriginal and, and the Torres Strait Islander people have been against this type of research for the reasons of not being asked and being inclus, included in this research. It is a shock to me, I will say, that I, ANU, after many years of rejecting this, I've been involved with the ANU for many years, that this type of research has occurred uh, and the centre has opened such as this. I do applaud what you're doing in the efforts to consult. But one of the things that this university has not had and does not have is an, uh, an Indigenous uh, Ethical Advisory Committee. This university continues to do research in archaeology, anthropology, um, uh, human biology. It's increasing areas. It's doing repatriation. It has two Indigenous staff lecturing only in the whole university. There is a whole basis of moral and ethical considerations to consider in any ethical, biological and genetical research basis. We have not given this permission. Our communities and our elders have held steadfast in ensuring that this research does not occur until we have a national debate. 
The concern I have here, and I will be discussing this with my communities around the country, because it, I'm, and I do a, a, applaud that there has been reason in a public environment, and this is great. It allow us now to have the discussion, uh, have decisions and input at the university level, and I and, and I see there's colleagues from other uni, um, universities here. But this is a national debate that needs to be held by Indigenous Australians. One of the issues about of of coming with relation to this is ethical and uh, ethical um, and moral considerations that evolve around the whole gamut of research areas here. I do applaud, and, I, and there is area here for medical research, um, considerations and health. But one of the issues that have been is, and is a fundamental concern and I still have is, what about um, the issues where we've said no before about genetical research on the origins of our people? The issues are, are we indigenous or not? I feel this conversation is yet to have, and I know you've got um, areas to expand. I have an issue that the centre was set up without the approval. One of the things on the United Nations Declaration of, of Indigenous Peoples and the Charter which Australia has signed is, that we, is, is to consult with Indigenous Peoples and that we should have free and prior informed consent in any engagement or research. Look at the GERIS, the Research Guidelines for Ethical Research at IATSIS, which is the leadership body to carry out ethical research or in Indigenous peoples. I feel that you have a long way to go to this, and I'm, I support the fact that you've now got a public uh, forum, and we will be discussing this, for, this publicly. Um, and you're on a brink of area, areas that are, are very close to a lot of people. There will be backlashes. There will also be a lot of support, and I, I do com commend that. But I do feel this institution has a long way to go in its engagement with Indigenous people on any area of research. There's enough funding going through at ANU across Indigenous fields of study, yet there are hardly any Indigenous people here in research positions, let alone an ethical body, and I don't feel that ANU is in a position yet to do an international research, be an expert on Indigenous people, when there are so few of us here to comment being engaged and being consulted. However, I do commend and, and appreciate being invited to uh, be able to come tonight um, at a public forum. These sort of projects need to be transparent, um, and you are doing that. And you will deal with the, back, or with the comments as we go through, and um, let the debate begin. Thank you very much. Well, well thank you very much for your comments, and I very much look forward to following up with you to discuss things further. Um, we, we have done, as far as we possibly can, everything we, we can think of to be um, as open as possible, to engage with people appropriately. You'd appreciate that uh, people in particular communities need to be contacted first. Um, we've set up the Indigenous governance structure that overcovers it in a general sense, but, but I agree with you, we have a long way to go. There's one area, and for example, um, ancestral skeletal remains. There's collections here. With, you're doing it, ANU's doing a repatriation project at the moment. There's, a, there's how, ancestral remains held here. We've got the Mungo collection here. I've been talking to the Muddy Muddy people, the traditional owners of Willandra today. They'll be putting an injunction on ANU and national parks about the, to ensure in this period of we don't know what's happening, that ancestral remains are not being utilised by scientists and uh, researchers without informed consent and, uh, and approvals. There's dangers there, there's a lot of benefits, but there are a lot of dangers, and unless you have an Indigenous body guided by Indigenous professionals, as well as representatives from our elders, to cross the, discuss the range of areas, there are a lot of unanswered questions, uncertainties, which make us nervous. And we feel that such a research proposal body or areas, such as old traditional uh, institutions like ANU, <coughs> should be having indigenous guidance and governance. There's areas, issues of cultural competency here in relation to talking and dealing and researching with our people, which I feel has, um, needs to be discussed further, certainly in ANU. I, I, I dispute the question of best practice. How can you have best practice of ANU when you don't even have an indigenous uh, leadership uh, or ethics committee uh, in your research and um, ethics uh, decision making? I would question the, the level of uh, 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 cultural competency in dealing and liaising with indigenous people. Yes, you've got some wonderful, um, um, high-profile indigenous um, elders and, and who we respect, but this, this is a national issue and has international uh, connotations. And uh, I think that we need to have further discussion on this. And I certainly will be ensuring that it happens. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to comment.
as well on that point because I agree with you and I just would like to um, say I'd be also interested to, to be part of those discussions. I'm Misty Jenkins, I'm on the board and I'm a Gunda Jamara woman and I must say um, that is something that we do want to stop and I think that's sort of the point of NSIG really is to put this in the, in, in the national spotlight to be able to put ethics and governance, indigenous focused frameworks around this stuff and stop the cowboys coming in from overseas and sequencing its skeletal remains from museums and coming in and taking samples without consent. We want to put a stop to that. And that's what that's what the sort of that's what this is the beginnings of. Sure. Good I've worked a lot with Gunditch Mara and I know your process and very Gunditch Mara are very strong in standing up on on all your heritage projects, your histories. The issue here is also uh, as we have the Commonwealth policy, a guideline to consult in, uh, Indigenous peoples on uh, Indigenous heritage values uh, and social values of sites and places. It's called Ask First. This process, I would argue, should have had an Indigenous body governance thing to ask. It's, it's a step up of research that was declined and knocked back in, a, in the political hot phase. You'll bring it back in the political hot phase now. but. I would, have, uh, I would have questioned the, the rights of Indigenous Australians to be involved, engaged, to... I mean, the question is, to, is asking Indigenous Australians, we need to have this communicate, what are your aspirations for yeah, um, research at ANU? Do you have aspirations for uh, or, um, um, genetic research? Uh, we need to have those topics before you set up the school and then consult second. I okay, think that's so pause can, can I thank you for your comments? Um, uh, um, you know, I think there's a lot of discussion that needs to be yes. to be had. It may well be worthwhile you coming along sometime and talking to the Indigenous members of our government's board and discussing these issues. Um, but can I actually ask someone else to, to have a chat now? I want to thank you for making me feel like my living culture, my soul, my spirit is just not recorded in DNA it's, and it's another way I feel it's going to separate us, another way to group all us black fellas internationally all together to find out what's missing and miss around our DNA again. I just think that's what it feels like. I'm sorry I felt you mumbled through half of your presentation, I missed a lot. Whether I'm getting old and can't hear, maybe a genetics can answer that question. But I just feel that there's no community Members, um, I work in the health field. We always insist on consumer involvement. While I acknowledge that our elders that you've got are great academics, you need more than just academics to drive this. This is about us living, breathing culture that needs to have support and the layman people there involved at the coalface negotiating and explaining. That's just, I just, I'm just gobsmacked about how this, I feel, is going to send us back to the mission days where our children got removed because of our DNA. Yeah, so thank you for that comment. Can I just respond, Simon, very briefly? I think um, uh, it's important to understand that we uh, are focusing our efforts in three areas initially because we uh, obviously um, want to get things right and uh, that that we don't have a lot of resources. And in those areas, we are doing exactly as you suggest and engaging with local people and explaining things to local you know, people. They're not your governance. There's also academia on the governance. You need to have people from the community, laymen, that to there to get to some reality around how it <coughs> impacts at the coal face. Because as an academic, you can sometimes get lost in it. I know. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So we do have Indigenous people on our research advisory committee too, and we have representatives. Are those community people, community uh, people? Some of those people. Some of those people are yes. On the governance structure. In, in on the uh, research advisory committee, yeah. On the governance structure. Well, that's part of the governance. That's part of the governance structure. Yes. Well, yeah. I didn't see them there. Okay. So, there. so, can we take this offline? Anybody else have any other questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, also an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander woman and the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander advisor at NHMIC. Um, and I guess you talked about ethics, so what's the uptake of the values and ethics guidelines and the keeping research on track documents that, that NHMIC have? I don't know if this is on. Yeah. Um, um, and also in relation to the IATSIS ethics guidelines. And, and secondly, um, I guess, how are you learning from other um, research areas like the Faxia 
longitudinal study of Indigenous children where they've gone into communities and worked really well to get that engagement. So, you know, lessons learned from other research projects. Well, the, the, I think that we haven't engaged with them, but we, I think that's obviously something we need to do. Um, we've attempted to, as, uh, to the, uh, the full extent we can, to incorporate the principles of the, the other documents in our governance and ethics framework. Um, and as you know, we've had discussions with the NHMRC and we've made submissions to various processes associated with that too. Yeah. Emma, do you want to make any comment? Yeah. based around the, the principles of, of values and ethics and keeping research on track and, and the JERIS guidelines. But um, an issue that's been really obvious to me for a few years now is that there is, this, there is this gap, policy gap, that the values and ethics guidelines do not cover handling of biospecimens and how bio, indigenous biospecimens should be collected, <coughs> stored, used. N none of that is covered. In other countries, like, like in North America, in Canada, the um, National Indigenous Guidelines do cover this, and I've been having conversations with the NHMRC for a few years now to say that I really hope um, in the current review of those yeah. guidelines that MC can have a, a big role um, and drawing on our government's ethics framework, which has for the first time um, brought uh, what we think are best practice and best cultural, co cultural competent practice to the question of handling of biospecimens. Thanks. Uh, Robin Bancroft, the main of Anjuan. I'd just like to make a, a very small comment. David, I understand your concerns on ethics. I think, as a student, a past student, we've been looking at ethics at ANU for over 25 years, general ethics across the board here, and we've been fighting a hard fight on that. And it looks like we haven't got very far ahead. No, no, I agree. I just wanted that to bring that to your attention. Quite please look. Uh, just to make a comment, I run the office of the staff for the ethics committee. Um, and um, one of the things we recently did was to extend an invitation to the uh, chair of the, the access ethics committee to come and uh, take part in, in one of our ethics sessions so there can be increased transparency. We're, we're, and this project is part of that strategy. The NCIG governance is trying to put in place structures which will then um, flow into um, <coughs> the rest of the university's uh, research activity. This is, this is the kind of, you know, this is breaking you know, considerable ground, not just um, in the genomics field, but in, in lots of uh, consultations with indigenous communities. Um, I um, have heard recently descriptions of the interactions that have actually taken place with the communities and the, the openness with which that's been discussed and Nick Buda's chairmanship of that and the discussions has been exceptionally effective and that's, that learning has been brought back in to, to the activities that uh, we've been discussing tonight. So I think the more openness we have, the better. The more engagement we have, the better. And I think from that, everybody benefits. And it's also worth reiterating that these, you know, these blood samples have just been sitting there since the 1960s, right? So none of us, no one here collected them. They, they were, they've been sitting there for many years. And it was Simon who went, oh, hang on a second. I think the ethics around this, you know, oh, I'm not comfortable with this. I, I think, you know, we need to go and get talk to Indigenous people and find out what they think about this. And this is just the start of that process. This is in its infancy. Nothing has happened and nothing will happen. They will stay locked down and, you know, unless community want to get involved, right? So this is the start. This is, this is the first public lecture at the start of the process. And so if the mob come back and say, actually, nah, we don't like this at all, then, then that's fine and that's no, okay. And that, that's right. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's a really important message right. to get across though, yeah. is that no one at NSIG is making any decisions. All of those decisions will come from community. So just be aware that there are a lot of issues. Yeah. Yeah, and it's good to bring them up and discuss them. I think this has been extremely valuable. You said that there's only 7,000 um, samples anyway, aren't there, in that regard? I mean, there is still... Um, 
plenty of other people out there. I mean, I don't think you need to just give a dote on those 7,000. There's no reason why you go on forward and um, get permission and to do it the, the correct way. No, that's, that's right, and, and, and our primary concern is to do the right thing by these samples. And, um, but the, uh, as a, uh, the framework we're setting up provides a means of taking it further than that. There are people in other communities who, who are interested in discussion, discussing being involved. There are studies that may be incorporated within this. So we're trying to set up a framework, and um, uh, we, we, we're starting from nothing, and we've, we've, as Misty said, we're trying to go out to um, indigenous people and indigenous communities and find out what they want and then incorporate that into the way we do things. And I just emphasize again the, 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 the point I made earlier about reciprocal transformation. The ANU hopefully will be transformed by yeah, this process. The samples you've got, you really are, you know, the actual individual people that That's they correct, yes. Those we have, could, we have and we are, yes. Yeah, just phone calls going on at permission. That's exactly what we're doing, yeah. yes. Okay. Any further comments, questions, discussion? Who wants to add to this lively debate? Okay. Well, Simon, thank you very much for that. It was a great talk, and thank you for the audience for a great response.